Namaste, Hari Bol. My name is Janapati Das, and today what we're going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about how I came to the process of Sadhana Bhakti, or the hearing and chanting of Krishna's names, the uh, story in my life of how I came to this point. And uh, it's a nice story when you meet devotees to actually hear about how they came, what, how they lived their life, and what brought them to the process of Sadhana Bhakti or hearing and chanting Krishna's names, and um, you know how it affected them and everyone around them. So this is my story, and um, let me offer my first offer my respectful obeisances unto my spiritual master Jagad Guru Siddhaswarupananda. Paramahamsa Srila Prabhupada, whose mercy and kindness uh, has brought me to where I am today. Um, without his mercy, without his kindness, without his love, um, my life would be completely useless. And so I, I forever offer my respectful obeisances to his lotus feet in the hopes that I may be pleasing to him and to Krishna and to Lord Chaitanya. Uh, I would like to offer, also offer my respects to you for seeing, watching this video. Please feel free to subscribe here to my channel um, and uh, make any comments on the, on the videos here. The first thing I would like to do is to engage in the hearing and chanting of Krishna's names. It's the thing that my spiritual master taught me is the prime benediction and the main means by which we can come to our uh, state of self-realization or understanding of who we are, what the purpose of our life is, and um, what we should be doing in this life. So please join along.
Hari Bol, Krishna Krishna, please accept my respectful obeisances. This is my story, or at least some of my story. So my birth name in this world is James, and of course my, my initiated name is Janapati Das. I was born uh, July 3rd, 1969 in California. Sacramento, California. I basically grew up in Davis, California, in a family, in a Catholic, heavily Catholic family of seven, uh, seven kids. And as I said, I, I grew up in, with a background in Catholicism and Christianity, of which I'm actually eternally grateful for, even though I didn't continue becoming, being a, a following the Catholic tradition um, I was, I am eternally grateful that I was brought up in a somewhat moral and um, religious family. Um, my parents are very loving. They're very loving. I grew up in a very loving and supportive family. Um, and um, I had a very strong uh, spiritual inclination, I think, from a very young age. Uh, I used to have a, a lot of really intense spiritual and religious dreams as a child um, much to the excitement of my mother <laughs> who would uh, hope that I would one day become a priest or and uh, but I had very heavy sim symbolic and religious dreams about Lord Jesus Christ and so I had a very strong attraction to Lord Jesus Christ and I, that still remains to this day um, I think probably you know when I was getting older, around 16 or 17, I, I started having questions about, you know, the, the Catholic faith, um, which I, you know, I, I don't want to make this a, a situation of, you know, bashing on any kind of religion, um, but I felt like there were inconsistencies in the philosophy that I just, I didn't understand, like, you know, the difference between you know, who is God is supposed to be Jesus and Jesus was God. But how is it that God sacrificed himself? If God would sacrifice himself in death or would die, then everything would cease to exist. And so by the time I was, you know, you know, already 18, I was questioning things and uh, had some, you know, but I still had a very strong uh, love for Lord Jesus Christ and, um, by the time I was 21, I had gone off to college and um, I found that, you know, that experience was quite a, um, what do they call that, a, a, a paradigm shift, being in a completely new environment on, the, on my own, going to a different school that really wasn't, you know, t two and a half or three hours away from where I grew up. But I mean, basically separating myself out of that, out of my family uh, situation there. Um, led me to um, have a lot of struggles, which, you know, nowadays don't, don't really seem to be uh, so, so um, you know, serious <laughs> as they were at the time, but that I, I found myself questioning more and more religion, and um, I, it led me on to I guess that was sort of a time where I felt like I was an agnostic. I, be, I kind of proclaimed myself an agnostic and I started reading a lot of stuff. And I think that reading, that search for knowledge um, led me on through the, you know, through the rest of my life. Um, and when I was, I would say, I had a lot of really interesting experiences during that time, a lot of traveling to different countries experiences of different cultures and different traditions and different spiritual and religious traditions that I read about and I studied and and I wondered you know is it is it just you know is it that there's more to this is this you know the Christian faith right is it wrong is you know so I had all these questions that I, I, I was searching for and I read and a lot of things and I just kept it kept compelling me and kept drawing me towards a situation. Now, when I was um, uh, about, I guess, 20, 
27 or 28, yeah, probably 27, 26, 27, uh, I had a situation where my, my, my grandmother passed away and I had gotten some money. I had been in a relationship that was really sort of toxic with uh, my ex-girlfriend at that time and um, receiving that money sort of compelled a different paradigm shift where I left, you know, broke up with my girlfriend and got out of that toxic relationship and, you know, uh, shifted into another more positive situation with certain kind of friends and whatnot. And um, at receiving that money made it so that I was able to travel to um, West Africa to study uh, music. <clears throat> now, that was a very compelling situation because um, being in that environment and studying music in a rural area of of uh, Ghana, what southwestern Ghana, um, made it so that I could, uh, that I was very attracted to that. And I'd been in San Jose, California for a while, and I felt like, you know, I'd been there eight years, and I felt like something needed to change. So this going to Africa made a big difference because it sort of, I when I got back from that experience of studying music there, <clears throat> I felt like, <coughs> excuse me, I felt like um, I wanted to do it again. So I enrolled in the Peace Corps and the following year I went to the, uh, the Republic of Gambia. And Gambia was, it was a very, that Peace Corps experience was extremely uh, vital and, and, and significant event in my life. That two years was so deep and so uh, compelling that um, when I got back, I felt like I had a really bad culture shock. Um, while I was there, it was a Muslim country, so I had started to read about the um, about Islam, and because it was a Muslim country, and I started reading the Quran. Now, when I came back, I I felt sort of empty from you know finishing this very enriching and and deep experience that I. Um, I went to look for that again. So I went to the local mosque and uh, became a Muslim. And <laughs> probably for all the wrong reasons, probably, you know, because at the time I was trying to find, fill that, that emptiness that was not really a spiritual emptiness, but it was this emptiness from what, but actually probably it really was in the long term, that f fulfilling that sort of uh, experience that I'd had when I was in the Peace Corps. And, um, which I felt like was a really significant experience in my life. And so I began my two or three um, years experience in um, being a Muslim, being a Muslim. So I went to the mosque, at the, I did praying and at the mosque and I followed the particular things like Ramadan and I studied the Quran. And But what was really interesting is I felt like, I always felt like it was sort of an external experience because I wanted to have a really I knew that I really wanted to have something as compelling as what I had experienced um I guess the closest thing was you know my relationship to Jesus Christ as a Catholic um even though I felt like the Catholic religion just didn't do it for me um and what I would do is I would ask people all the time you know, how do you have a, a loving relationship with Allah? And nobody could really tell me. They just, you know, you, you've got to follow these particular pillars and da da da, da. But there was no real, like, disciplical lineage. There is no disciplical lineage in Islam. I think the closest thing that there is is, is sometimes in the Sufi, traditional Sufi uh, uh, outspurt of Islam. Uh, there is a disciplic lineage of Sufi spiritual masters. Um, and so uh, I actually started becoming more and more, uh, uh, what's the word, sort of uh, discouraged by, by the fact that nobody really knew how to do this. And, and the fact that there was really a heavy emphasis on politics. And um, I think there was an experience where I went to the mosque and in, in a Islamic convention to hope with the hopes of 
finding more classes and more teachers that would teach me how you have a loving relationship. But most of these um, classes were about Israel or, you know, the, the, the Muslim Brotherhood around the world and politically. And, and um, I found that there was no class. There was actually no class about how you could have a loving relationship with Allah. And, and I think there was one experience that finally kind of put the cap on it for me where, where a, a imam, the imam is kind of like a priest of this particular class that was talking about Israel. And he said, you know, people want to call these um, terrorists, the people terrorists who are, you know, Palestinian or whatever, um, as suicide bombers. Let's call them as they are, martyrs and heroes. And I thought, no, that's that doesn't resonate right with me. I was like, you know, the, you, I, they might have a good cause, but but to blow up, you know, innocent people and hurt innocent people, and that that to me really soured everything. So I, I stopped going to the mosque and I kind of stopped following Islam. And incidentally, later on when I found met, you know, was introduced to Sadhana Bhakti and you know learned about. Um, my spiritual master, Siddhaswar Pananda, uh, I learned more about Islam and religion than I'd ever learned from previous experience in those things. So fast forward a little bit, about three months after I had stopped going to the mosque, you know, and I'd also had all these attractions, like I was still, you know, doing certain kinds of drugs and, and whatnot. And, um, I couldn't lose the attraction for that. And I felt like in my heart, I shouldn't really be doing this, but I wanted to do it, but I couldn't really find a real legitimate reason why I shouldn't do it. And I was going along in Sacramento and on my bike, and I was going through Sacramento State University when I came by a bulletin board that had a flyer. And the flyer was for the Lotus Garden Meditation Center, which is one of the centers in Sacramento that teaches about bhakti yoga and sadhana bhakti and meditation. And I saw, you know, I read it and I thought, oh, that's really interesting, you know, because I was, you know, even though I was following Islam, I, I, I read all kinds of books about, you know, everything from different kinds of yoga texts and uh, Buddhism and this, you know, the Diamond Sutra and, you know, all these books that I've read, you know, I read the, the, um, the, um, I was just skipping my mind, but you know, of course, there could be Quran and the Bible and all these different, you know, people, this spiritual writer and that spiritual writer, but nothing really was resonating with me, seriously. But I saw this flyer and I thought, oh, that sounds really interesting. And it's here in Sacramento. Maybe I should go to that. So I went back and went home and I, I forgot about the flyer. And so uh, a week later, I was somewhere and I saw the same flyer and I thought, oh, there's that flyer, you know. <laughs> I should go there, you know. So they've got Tai Chi and yoga and all these things and they have feasts and on the weekend. And so of course I forgot about it again, but then the person I was living with, you know, a friend of mine that I was you know, roomating with at the time, he one day he showed me the flyer again. He was like, hey, we should go check this out. And incidentally, this friend of mine is also still chanting to this day. But we went to the Lotus Garden. We took a long trip down to Carmichael and we, we took a meditation one class. And, you know, I, I don't really remember too much about it other than the fact that, you know, uh, my friend was really into it. And I was like, okay, well, this is nice, you know. And um, the, 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 the person giving the class, his name is Rupa Nugadas, he, he, he said, well, we have this, this gathering on, on, we have this, you know, thing on Sunday where you can come and we do more of what we learned here and we have a dinner and everything. I was like, I thought, oh, that's great. Okay, we'll come back. So Sunday we came back and we came and everybody was there and, and I realized, wow, okay, there was more to it that I picked up on this time. The fact that there was a lot of singing and <clears throat> the kirtan that we're doing and, and there were these pictures of Krishna <laughs> everywhere. <clears throat> I was like, whoa, what is this? You know, like, it's very interesting. And um, it was really nice, though. You know, the things that I got immediately picked up on, and one was the fact that being a musician, I saw that everybody was, you know, the music was amazing. The kirtan, of course, it's transcendental, and I didn't realize that's what was touching my heart. And um, so 
so I, I, I was like, okay, this is, this is really amazing. And of course the food was really amazing, which is Prash Maha Prashadam or Prashadam, which is not different than Krishna. And uh, the thing I noticed about the music though, was that, you know, having played in clubs and whatnot, you go there and people are all like, it's like a, a sketchy scene. Like people are checking you out. Who's that, you know, who's that boy? Who's that girl looking at you and everything. But everybody at this kirtan was, just focused on the singing of kirtan, singing the mantras. And I just thought, that's amazing. They're all focused on Krishna here. And it's really, really wonderful. And so um, I kept going because it was something really fun and I was very attracted to. And then I, you know, my friend who I was rooming with, he was, he was also into it. So we would just drive down to the center every Sunday and do that. And so that was the gradual process of, um, and there was one more significant, uh, you know, it, it, it is a process that's been going on for now for 20 years or so for me. Um, and there are many, many stories within that that, that uh, reflect uh, the, the experiences that I've had that have shown my spiritual growth and, um, and wonderful things that have happened and, and you know, meeting my spiritual master and being initiated by my spiritual master. But one very significant event was about two or three weeks after I'd come first to this meditation class, I went, started going to this camping, meditation camping thing. I was at Mount Diablo and there were two really nice disciples of Srila Prabhupada and, and one who's also a disciple of Bhaktivedanta and, their names are Kalavati Dasi and Smarnam Das, and they would have these camping treat, retreats up in Mount Diablo, which is like Concord, California, like that area. And um, it's just a big mountain, right? And uh, so I would go to this, and I remember I was going for a Japa walk one day, and that's a meditation with the bees, of course. <clears throat> and I was going up the, the hill, and I just had this feeling that I want to pray before I started doing my, my meditation of my japa and I said you know I just said Krishna or God or whoever whatever your name might really be or if it is Krishna I said I, I'm tired I can't look I can't put this kind of energy anymore into looking for you my life is I'm unhappy in my life and I just need to be with you God and if this is not what I'm supposed to be doing, please don't leave me on anymore. Please don't just tell me that this is the right, wrong or right thing to do. I just need to know. And actually that night I had a dream. And the dream was that I was coming down out of the mountains after that Joppa walk. And there was a storm brewing up in the mountains that was coming, gonna come down into the valley. And so there was no way for me to return back the way I came. And so I thought, oh, I have to take shelter. I have to take shelter for the night. So I, I got out my blue tarp and tried to set up my, <laughs> set up a makeshift uh, tent and the storm blew in and I was in there just getting wet and just like, oh, it's miserable. It's like really bad makeshift shelter. And I looked over and there was a ranger station, a log cabin, right? It looked warm and inviting and I, and I thought, I wonder if I should go over there and I was deliberating, you know, oh, I you know, don't want to disturb them or, but you know, I'm getting wet and unhappy over here. I should go to that log cabin and take shelter. And I knew immediately that was my answer that, you know, there is a symbolism, of course, coming down out of a journey, you know, and not being able to go back the way you came, but to go forward, and, but you have to take shelter. And, you know, of course, my brother-in-law told me later that he, it was interesting that my makeshift shelter was blue, you know, like a fake Krishna, like I was trying to take shelter in myself and it was just not working out well. But I saw that there was a, shel a strong shelter in Krishna and my spiritual master that I should be taking shelter in. And um, so, you know, I took the shelter <laughs> and continued to take the shelter. And that's, you know, that was, you know, uh, it wasn't just an immediate thing, but uh, I found that that like I just kept applying the process and that I found that it just revealed itself and it continues to reveal itself 
uh, ever, ever more. And so I, my, my, my prayer for you and my hope for you is that you just take shelter to trust the process, to take shelter every day, not in your mind and your own achievements, but in Krishna and your spiritual master and to hear Krishna, you know, to take, take shelter in that process enables it so that Krishna can, you know, so that the, what they call the the um, bijalata, right? Bijalata, the seed of devotional service that your spiritual master gives you. If you cultivate it with water and protect it with a fence from any kind of offenses, and you try to cut away the the you know anarthas or unwell un uh, wanted desires, um, you'll find that your your spiritual life will grow. That Krishna's light will shine from you. And you can you can help others truly so that is my brief story of uh, you know there are many many other stories hopefully uh, I'll get a chance to tell those about different situations that I've had in my life because of my um, taking shelter of my spiritual master and and Krishna and Lord Chaitanya's and so thank you very much let's chant a little bit all right then.
Okay, and that is my little story of how I came to chanting. There's a lot more to it. Maybe someday I'll hopefully add in a few different stories of my experiences. Uh, feel free to comment below, and even if you have a little bit of your own story, feel free to share in my comment section. Thank you very much. Hi, Bull Namaste.